Thank you, Brian, and thank you for that introduction, which even without your iPad, you, you managed. Um, thank you all for your attention and your uh, interest in coming out tonight. But I think you had to be here because I got to tell you, we are at a really, really interesting turning point when it comes to privacy. Um, I think Qatar is at a particularly interesting turning point because of your consideration of the privacy law. But I think we're at this interesting point now where people are asking, when I say I speak about the future of internet privacy, they say, oh, you mean there, there is one? There is a future? How, how is that possible? We already have all this data out there about us. Is it conceivable that we're going to get any privacy back when we're sharing our data on social networks, when ads are tracking us, when websites are tracking us, when what we search is tracked, when our mobile devices are tracking us? How can you talk about there being a future for internet privacy? And I do think we're at a point today where there is so much data that's being shared that we need to decide whether we want a world where data empowers us, where we find things quicker, we get directions, we get what we want served up and personalized for us, and we are smarter and more powerful because of the data that's available to us and because of the personalization? Or are we going to have a world where everyone knows more about us, websites and apps and mobile devices and companies and governments, and where increasingly we're hemmed in, decisions are made about us, do we even know how businesses are using the data that's collected and is it always for our benefit? I think there is a future for responsible data use. I don't see how we're going to put this back in a box. We want to connect. We want to interact with each other, right? Our, our youth and adults of every age want to use social media to connect across cultures, across countries, or within families that are spread um, uh, uh, through distance. We want um, mapping services. We are going to continue sharing data because we see the benefits. The question is, are the folks who we share that data with going to have our interests in mind? Now, I, I will tell you, it's very dangerous thinking that, you know, you're an expert. And even in this audience, you know, you are folks who come out to a lecture, uh, who, who work at ministries, who are in the technology business, who um, care enough to discuss internet privacy. So you are already an elite. You're not the average person you know, who's going about their business without thinking about uh, policy. And it's very dangerous to be in our space and then to make decisions about privacy because we can forget what the average person actually understands, um, what the average person wants to do to stop and think, or do they want to just download something? Do they want to just go about their business? It can be very easy to miss the game. And so the one thing I actually think uh, that I've been able to do during my career is not be an expert, but to try to keep that view of the average person on the street. I was a state legislator for many years, and when you're a local elected official, you really need to keep in touch with the people because you, you are um, you know, constantly responding to the concerns and the issues they raise. And I've kept that non-expert. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to try to talk to you today as someone who isn't an expert. And to prove that I'm not an expert, I'll tell you something that happened to me not that long ago. One of my best friends became um, the chief privacy officer of a company called thefacebook.com, it was known as then. And um, he said, you have to take a look at this. And I said, you're silly. You, know, you ought not to go work there. It's, it's for college kids. Uh, what you're doing is going to be far more successful. He didn't listen to me. He did go. And he convinced me to, to sign up and have a look. And I got hooked. I was interested. I was there poking some old friend and connecting with somebody across the Atlantic. And sure enough, I very soon had you know, several hundred friends, old employers, old girlfriends, uh, relatives, cousins, um, people I worked with. Uh, and I was very excited. My wife was not so excited because I'd come home from a long day at work. And then there I was in my uh, home office, poke here, poke this one, do this one. Uh, and she'd get very frustrated. You're working all day and now here you are coming home and you're wasting your time with Facebook. So I said, oh, I know what I'll do. There was this little application that you could download for Facebook, uh, the, the fun wall or something like that. And it sent a sparkling, smoochy kiss. So I said, okay, I'll send my wife a kiss and she'll appreciate that uh, this is not such a big waste of time. I'm doing something a little bit romantic here. 
So I download it and I click send and then I'm like, wait, I, I didn't select her name here. What, wait, how did I send it? What? And sure enough, this application has pre-checked all my friends. <laughs> so no big deal, all right, it's a little embarrassing that uh, the ex-girlfriend, the ex-employer, some journalists, reporters, workers, okay, it's a little bit embarrassing, but no big deal. I, I immediately post at the top of my page, friends, I, I like you very much, but I love only my wife. This application has turned me into an over-amorous spammer. My apologies. But no, 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 you see, my friend, the new chief privacy officer at Facebook, he was on the job. He didn't want people accidentally spamming everybody. So Facebook had put in place a rate limiting feature. I couldn't unsend it, but Facebook in its servers on the back would only send out seven or eight of the messages a day. So for the next three or four months, somebody selected from amongst my various friends would get this spooky, sparkling uh, kiss for several months. My wife claims that she's never actually received it. <laughs> so I think us, so, uh, us experts have to sort of remember that we're designing these things for actual you know, humans who are busy. Um, these, um, these interfaces need to be as simple as getting in and driving a car. We can't expect people to become experts like us who spend a good part of our day thinking or dealing with these issues. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, I, I started describing this world where everybody was tracked and profiled and uh, maybe you started saying, wait, I thought he was uh, a moderate here. I, I thought he's not a scary actor on privacy. So I want to describe to you a little bit what the system looks like today when you actually go on the web and what I think needs to happen to put you back in charge. And I'm optimistic that this is going to happen. So let me pull out the chart, if we can, um, that shows uh, the online advertising ecosystem. And as soon as it comes up, you'll see it. I'll see it. Okay. Uh, there it is. So here's our friendly average person sitting at the computer and they've just pulled up a popular website. They haven't clicked on anything, they haven't downloaded anything, they've just visited a page. The average user has no clue that their browser goes on a mission every time you visit a typical web page. It goes to an ad server and it shows some information about itself, some information about you, and it gets an ad. It goes to an analytics company where information is recorded so the website can analyze usage. It may go to a market researcher. It may go to an ad exchange. It may go to a data exchange, an affiliate marketer. 30 or 40 places, perhaps, at many popular sites that have the full array of the bells and whistles that you see, ads and tracking and so forth. Many of these are sites that any average person can set up and put on free code. You don't need to be a big developer to put on Google Analytics. You don't have to pay for it even. It's free. You don't have to be a giant company to have ads delivered on your site. You put on a little bit of code. You don't even have to know how to program it. You cut and you paste and you drop. And then from then on, what you do as you visit these sites is logged and is recorded. And the ads that you see are tailored based on what's known about you and stock markets where companies bid to try to reach the kinds of users they want because of offline information that's been added to your cookie is then quickly and instantly available. It's become very efficient, it's become very fast, and it does something very interesting. It helps support much of the free content out there. So industry throughout the world says, look, this is a good thing. Would you rather pay for the site or would you rather it be free? Well, it's free, but it's not completely free. It's free in exchange for your data. And if I understand what's happening when I visit a website, and I understand that you're trying to serve me and you're trying to help me, I might value it. When you use an Amazon or a Netflix or other services that are obviously customized, and they're tracking some very important information, your books, videos, things that people can be very sensitive about, Generally, in countries around the world, people like it. I understand you're trying to sell me something, but you're trying to help me find what I want. No crime there. But when I'm traveling around the web and things are being tailored and I don't understand how it's happening, then I'm a little bit worried about what's happening and I don't know who's getting the data and is it being used to maybe give me a higher price because of what you know about me? Um, am I gonna be discriminated against? 
Who else has access to that data? Who knows what I'm searching for? Some of the most sensitive information. One a writer called it uh, the database of intentions. All the things that we think in our heads that might be in search results. And so my argument is, as this becomes increasingly a controversial practice around the world, the Europeans want to regulate it where users should have to expressly opt in. Uh, in the US, the debate's been going on for maybe a decade. Um, the um, regulators have called for a do not track list. One of the most popular things that was ever done in the uh, United States was a do not call list. We have maybe 150 million people who've signed up to not be direct marketed through over telephones because they don't want to be interrupted during their dinner or they don't want the intrusion. And so they've signed up for the do not call list. And so some policymakers have said, maybe we need a do not track list. Now, how exactly you might sign up to not be tracked creates a lot of technical challenges, but you can see why it has the right um, uh, political uh, uh, sound. So can this be solved? I mean, are we at this sort of impasse where the companies must track you um, and the only alternative is uh, for you to actually pay for the service? My argument is that making this information transparent demystifies it, telling you what I'm doing. I'm trying to help you, I'm trying to serve you, I'm trying to sell you something. That's not so scary. Doing something secretly in the background, uh, that's a bit scary. So some companies, Google, Yahoo, others, have started showing users their profile. You can click through to their privacy policy and then they've got a place where they'll show you that clickstream profile that's been created about you. Now what do you think is happening when people click through? Do they run away? Oh my gosh, look what's known about me. Oh my goodness. In fact, not. What Google has reported is that of every 15 users who click through and take a look at their profile, this is somebody interested in sports and finance and vacations to Switzerland, um, uh, uh, what they do is they don't turn it off. Of every 15 users, 10 look at it and do nothing. Four actually edit it. They take some information, they add some information, they want it to be right. One out of 15 actually turns it off. So I think that starts to show you that when people see what's going on, they don't run away from this. They feel empowered by it. So one of the things our think tank did was, is we said, how are we going to explain this to people? I can't show everyone a chart and start explaining cookies and log files and IP addresses and how the targeting and the appending is happening. The average user is just doing their business. So we said, how about let's turn, in, let's turn to the marketers, not the lawyers, not the policymakers, who will design us a very complicated notice that, again, the elite will read. How do we turn to the people who are experts at talking to actual consumers, the marketers, the people who are trying to sell you things in the first place? Let's ask them to work with us to design a symbol. And so we tested some symbols. In the US, the Federal Trade Commission said, we have some ideas for what that should say. We said, OK, we'll test it. What do you want it to say? They said, it should say on every ad, why this ad? And then people will know, hey, there's something to investigate over here. And we said, you know, I don't think that accomplishes. We want to brand this. We want it to mean something. You know in the hotel which room is the restroom because there's a symbol there. It means something. In many countries, you know that uh, there are certain products that can be recycled because of the symbol, right? We know what certain road signs are because we've been educated to, to um, understand what they mean. What is the symbol that says something like smart data at work here for you? How do we do that? When I was the Consumer Affairs Commissioner in the uh, city of New York, the um, colleague of mine was the transportation commissioner. And one of his big projects was to try to change all the signs wherever there was construction going on. Uh, the signs used to say something like, we apologize for the delays, we regret the inconvenience. He hated that. He insisted that all the signs be uh, changed to something like, your taxpayer dollars at work for you, to the positive. And I thought he was crazy. I didn't understand. And now I stand and I look at this a couple of years later and I say, look, how do we communicate with users? We are doing something smart for you. Make it work better. Maybe give us more data to make it work smart as opposed to we're sneakily tracking you in the background. By the way, read about how we're protecting your privacy. When we've done testing of privacy policies and people start reading and, and they're talking to a business who is in the business of marketing and using their data and the first line is, um, here's how we respect your privacy and we share your data in these ways, 
you can imagine, you know, the reaction is very cynical. Yeah, thank you. But if you said to the user, we're using your data to try to sell you things we think you want. We want to do as good a job as possible. Are we getting it right? Now we're in a relationship that makes some sense. So when we tested at the request of the Federal Trade Commission why this ad, do you know what people said? They said, I'm just going about my business here. I'm checking my email. I'm looking at a website. I'm doing a search. What are you asking me a question? Why this ad? I don't know the answer. Is it a quiz? I don't like being quizzed. Or is this a trick? And I got to click to find out whether I even care about this answer. And then maybe I won't be able to click back. There'll be a pop-up. I'll lose my place. If you have something to say to me, say it. And then I'll click and I'll learn whether I need to know more information. That wasn't intuitive to the regulator. The regulator said, well, we should tell people privacy information and we know how to write a legal notice. Actually doing the consumer testing was incredibly interesting and you start learning how people think and how they act and how they want to communicate. So we tried to design some symbols that were meaningful to the users and industry groups in the end of the day tweaked it a bit, turned it from a very interesting symbol into a less interesting symbol, but many of the banner ads that you see today on the uh, internet now come with this little triangle with an eye. Industry has not done a lot of job educating around this, so this can be there and if you didn't pay attention to it, you didn't even see it. It was invisible. So my argument is that if this has any hope of working, they need to communicate with users around it. But billions and billions of those little banner ads now come with that little symbol which is supposed to indicate to users smart data is at work for you and when you click on it, you then get some information and then hopefully, they haven't required this, but many sites are actually showing you some of that online data. We'll see whether that's enough for policymakers. Um, some of them still want do not track. Um, industry doesn't love the idea of do not track. They believe that um, uh, users will expect that there is no tracking whatsoever. The reality is some data ends up being recorded whenever you interact with sites and services. Some of it is useful, some of it is necessary, some of it um, is critical to creating um, analytics that, are, that is necessary. Uh, and one of the big challenges for policymakers is when do you ask and when do you uh, don't ask? When does asking mean that you'll certainly say no because you don't see the benefit to you even though maybe there's benefit to society? Um, we saw the uh, UK Information Commissioner who has uh, been dealing with the latest revisions to privacy law in Europe where cookies in many countries are going to need to be opt-in. Users will have to say, I agree. And the industry isn't all that pleased with this. They worry that users will say, no thank you. I don't want your cookie. Keep it. I'm not hungry. Um, and so the information commissioner said, you know what, I'll show you how easy it is to do. And he put on his site, now again, this is not a marketing company where maybe I'll be skeptical, this is a government agency in charge of protecting your privacy. Why not say yes to him, right? What's he going to do with the data? And he said, here's a cookie and we use this cookie for analytics. We're not going to market to you, we're not going to send you any ads. This is just for us to understand how our site is used. What's wrong with that? Well, what do I care? doesn't help me. Yes, in the long run, it's good for all the other users of the site. It helps you uh, design the site better, but it's not going to do anything to me. And so unfortunately, very, very few people, uh, I think 15 or 20 percent, agreed and as a result, his analytics were no longer useful. In fact, the information commissioner in, the, in England, in the UK, is also the access to information commissioner and helps police government responding to requests by citizens for access to government data. So he was asked, hey, could you give us the records before and the records after? And sure enough, before, when nobody was being asked for any uh, permission to do analytics, the majority of users were in. Some were blocking cookies, but the majority were in. And as soon as it went to opt-in, boom, it disappeared. And so we see some challenges. It's very easy to say, just ask users. But what if users don't see the direct benefit to them that minute? Um, you know, in many countries in Europe, there is an opt-out when it comes to organ donations. In other countries in Europe, uh, like here, there is an opt-in. You must make a, an express decision. The rate in the countries where organ donation is opt-out is very, very high. The rate in countries where it's opt-in 
is much lower. The default rule when it comes to really important decisions like this, where people have strong feelings, right? Where you would think people really would make a strong decision whether or not the default was one way or another. This is something that has religious connotations, moral, ethical, right? There, there are things to think about. Um, when it comes to a click or data where the issues are important, I'd argue, but perhaps um, it can be easily rushed past, users end up doing what the default is, and we've seen that very powerfully. And so when we decide how to do a privacy law, and when we decide when to ask you, we've got to sit back and we've got to say, when is this data collection good for society? When is it going to create products and services that are useful? Mobile is one of we have where we have perhaps one of the most interesting challenges. Um, many of you may have seen many of the news reports around uh, Google's location services product. So here's how this works, and let's bring up the mobile um, uh, symbol, the, the mobile chart for a second. So you heard Brian talk about mobile being very personal, right? There was a study done recently that 80 or 90 percent of the people actually sleep with their phones. It's in their bed, it's within their reach, it's next to their dresser, right? This is personal. What can be more personal than this device that is in your pocket or is, you know, next to, to your bed when you're, uh, when you're sleeping? And, um, Many of us use the location services that are enabled by these, uh, by these phones. And it's very useful, right? We get directions. Um, and the way those location services work well, right? Number one, they use the cell towers. But number two, to get data more quickly and be more, more accurate, they look for local Wi-Fi routers. Right? And Google and Microsoft and Skyhook and a few other companies have driven the world, driven the world, recording the numbers, the MAC addresses, the IDs of the local wireless networks, the one you have in your home, the one that this hotel is broadcasting, and they've written down where they've seen that router. Now, Google got in trouble because many of us don't encrypt that network, don't have a password. And so while they were recording this information, they accidentally recorded whatever you were transmitting over the network. They were maybe it was a password, maybe it was a snippet of email, and they didn't intend to. They were driving by because they were building this big database of where every Wi-Fi router is. And they were recording also for their Street View product, right? So they accidentally recorded all kinds of pieces of information. They got in big trouble. They deleted it and so forth. But a lot of people woke up and said, what? You're driving around the world and recording everyone's uh, little Wi-Fi hotspot? What are you doing with that? And you're not the only one doing it. Everyone does it. And it turns out that our mobile phones location works quite well because in addition to triangulating off cell towers, the local Wi-Fi, right? If I turn on my phone right now, the reason it very quickly will find my location is because the Google car or the Microsoft car or one of the other companies drove by the hotel, wrote down that this MAC address that's broadcast by the, the, the Wi-Fi here is at this latitude and longitude at this hotel, and boom, it can pinpoint me far more quickly without running down the battery and so forth. So that's kind of useful. But if you asked me, if I asked you out of the blue when you turned on your phone and you bought your new iPhone 4S, by the way, may we um, record uh, any of the Wi-Fi routers in your house to build a global giant database um, which we'll use to improve location services? Most people would say, well, hey, explain to me, what, hey, where's my teenager? Someone, I need someone here to you know, tell me what's happening over here. And most of us would say, I don't know, doesn't sound good to me, right? But yet, if we didn't do this by default, the service wouldn't exist. If 10% of us opted in, then we'd turn it on, and sometimes it would work because it would have the information, and sometimes not. So the compromise that Google has made with some of the European regulators is that an opt-out will be provided if you can figure out how to go in and change the address on your router. So we talked about the do not call list. We talked about the do not track. So now there's another one. It's called do not track my router and put me in the global database of, of MAC addresses so that my phone doesn't contribute to this global positioning system. But I can still use it when I turn on my phone and have advantage of everyone else's, right? So most of us aren't going to use it, and the data collection will take place. So the mobile system is even more challenging. We, we, we looked at the online advertising system and all the places where your data goes. And we had a bunch of companies, the website, the ad network, the other parties in the system. Here's where it gets even trickier when it comes to mobile. Because I've got a mobile website sometimes. 
I have an app that I've downloaded. I have the Apple or the Android or the Symbian platforms. And then I've got the mobile advertisers. And each of them coexists with each other, sometimes you know, integrated and sometimes not. And that same set of very complicated ad networks and tracking and appending your data is now being built so to, as to support that app ecosystem, right? Because a lot of those apps that you downloaded are also free. Aha, now we've learned. Free in internet privacy means not so free, free of money, but in return for your data. Now we're doing good business here, okay? Now we're merchants and we're negotiating what the deal is and, and understanding what our terms are as opposed to navigating around, everything's free and everything's good. There's a data exchange here. Now, now that we're bargaining, how do I make sure that what you're doing with the data is what I want? Do we need an internet privacy law? Probably. Do we need good policies and practices? We do. Do we need consumers being in control because the device is easy enough to use? So I used to love what Apple did. Because again, do we want someone spending the time reading a privacy policy? A scientist at Carnegie Mellon University uh, did an interesting test of how much it would cost in terms of the hours you know, people spend if we had to read all of the privacy policies. You know? And it was billions of dollars to the economy in the US if every single person on the 50 or 60 different sites that they dealt with had to sit there and spend you know, five minutes, 10 minutes reading the different policies, how much time that would take out of the day. So clearly we don't want people reading the policies. So we need those symbols, we need those icons, we need those better ways that the marketers can design to communicate about data use. So Apple as this champion of you know, usability with innovative devices for a long time was doing some very interesting and useful stuff. When my location was going somewhere there was a little arrow that showed up and it didn't say privacy, learn about privacy, it said an arrow. My location is going to someone and there was a little arrow letting me know. I like that. Simple, reasonable, the newest version of the iPhone, which I ran out because I had to get, um, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know why I needed an iPad. I'm now hooked on my iPad. I, I need it. All of a sudden, I need the, the latest iPhone. And as I turned it on, it encouraged me to turn on location. OK. And then the arrow disappeared. So no longer will I know. It's there. It's buried. You can go find a setting. It takes six clicks to get to it. That will let you turn that arrow back on to tell you when location is being shared. What a step backwards, right? Tell me. Show me. The other day I was playing with some of the settings on my phone and I saw which apps had recently been getting my location. Oh, so this is interesting. Google Maps, okay, I get it. You, it's a mapping service, you had my location. But there was a battery charging app that I have that helps me better know when my phone is gonna run down. It was getting my location. So what? what it was gonna find the, the, lo, the closest outlet to plug in? I mean, that would be useful, but no, it doesn't do that. Um, and I realized, of course, it was because of the targeted ads. But how about asking me? Because I'd rather the ad be local and relevant and targeted, but when you do it without telling me something, then I feel, again, you've taken, um, um, uh, you've taken some advantage uh, of me. We're increasingly seeing some of the companies working on tracking you across the screens. So one screen is my mobile phone screen, my TV screen, and then my PC screen. And so we need to push companies to do more, not just to follow very narrow legalistic privacy rules, but to make data use a feature. And when you talk to a company about privacy, it's very hard to talk to a marketer about privacy. He's in, he or she's in the business of using your data. Privacy is for banks and security and, and keeping data close. We're talking to someone who's looking to use data to give you a better service. So we need to talk to them about responsible data use. We need to talk to them about how they can do better selling their service and do better providing service by using the data in a way that I am in control of. And then I may give you more information so that you can do a better job um, at, uh, at doing so. And in the mobile world, it's more important than ever because I have a very small screen and it can be hard to communicate. And so we need to think beyond privacy policies for ways that we can engage users. Should it tell me, should it read me my privacy policy? Um, you know, the new uh, iPhone 4S has a, a voice recognition tool that everybody is very excited about called Siri. I don't think it understands my New York accent because I asked it the other day, Siri, what's your privacy policy? And it said, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. So 
I'm, I'm hoping somebody maybe with a very good, you know, um, um, a clear accent will be able to get a better uh, answer. They, it has, of course, a written policy, but I was hoping it could, uh, uh, that it could respond to me. Um, we did a study a little while ago, uh, and we hope to do this maybe in Europe and in the Mideast, but we did it in uh, the U.S., Mexico, and Canada, because we think that different cultures look at data use and look at privacy with different views. And so we said to people in the U.S. and in Canada and Mexico, we did focus groups. We said, give us your phone. They said, no, no, no. We said, come on, give us your phone. We'll give it to you back to you. Give us your phone. Um, are you sharing your location with anything, with any service, any app? And some knew, some didn't. So we said, okay, now we're going to show you. And we took it and we said, hey, look. And of course, a majority of them you know, were wrong. They thought they weren't sharing, and they were. But the reactions were very different. The U.S. folks, they were annoyed, but they were sort of, well, I guess that app was free, so eh, I don't like that so much. Maybe I'll turn it off, but, but I need that app, so whatever. The Canadians started cursing. <laughs> what the? They started cursing. On the video, oh, they started cursing. Mexico, the uh, users said, oh, that's a good thing, because if something happens, if somebody's kidnapped, they'll know where you are. Mexico has, unfortunately, a very big problem with drug gangs and kidnappings, and, and there were people who you know, had this happen to them, had a family member, or were very aware of it from the media, and so they looked at it in a completely different way. What we also found is that a lot of the uh, instructions from the companies were written in English. And in, in Mexico, um, where not everybody spoke good English, they assumed that if it, because some things were translated and some not, so they assumed well, what was translated is relevant to me, and if it wasn't translated, then this is only applicable in the United States. It's not applicable in Mexico. Now, of course, they just didn't do a good job translating everything, but users assumed, the average user assumed, ah, this is not for me, this is, uh, this is irrelevant. Okay, so big deal, we're tracking you on your computer, we're tracking you on your phone, but your home is still safe, right? That's the sanctuary for privacy, the four walls of your home. Well, one of the big priorities around the world has been building out a smart grid. And a smart grid can do a great deal to help us manage energy better, to avoid peak events so that people understand that uh, they shouldn't put their dishwasher on while they're uh, doing their load of laundry more efficiently and smartly manage the power across the system. But it also means that the utility, the power provider, the company giving you the smart meter, can learn and understand what you're doing in your house. Because the meter is reporting back every 15 seconds how power is being used. Light is on in this room, your home. The heat lamp is on in the bathroom, someone's taking a shower. You haven't done a load of laundry in three weeks, and now you're finally doing it, but it looks like it's all towels because of the particular way that the heavy load, right? So you say to me, who cares about that information? Well, guess what? If I had said to the people who were building the early internet, listen, you have to worry about people's searches being tracked, you have to worry about the websites sharing everything you do, they would have said to me, what are you talking about? The internet, this is about research universities exchanging big files with each other to be able to do research. Maybe people will use this also for email, that seems interesting, but tracking everything that's being done, no way. And so when I talk to some of the utilities today and I say, listen, let me show you what's happening in the web. Let me show you what's starting to happen on the mobile world. You're building a platform that's going to record information about what's happening in the household. What's your plan? Say, so, oh, no, 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 no. I just am looking to do this little piece here. We know that if you build it, they will come. And indeed, there are marketers who spend millions and millions a year understanding why you do the wash on Thursday and how they can best sell you the right kind of detergent that you'll feel is going to do a better job. And so if the data can be collected, it will be. Government may want it. Um, parents may want to look in on what their teenager is doing when they're out of the home by uh, understanding uh, you know, what was going on in the house. If we build it, there will be uh, reasons. And so my argument is not don't build it. My argument isn't that these data uses are useful. They are useful. You know, uh, internet uh, folks used to talk for a long time about how one day we'll have a smart refrigerator. And what will it do? It will um, it'll tell you when to order some more milk. 
and we haven't seen that yet. You know, and around my house, we already have a, a, a smart system. You know, my wife sends me a text message, you dope, you finished the milk, why didn't you buy any more milk, pick it up on your way home, right? And it works, and it's electronic. But we do already have smart devices where my refrigerator, GE makes uh, uh, already devices, where my refrigerator will speak to my washer dryer and say, hey, I'm doing the wash now, don't make ice. Because who cares when ice is made? We just care that the, uh, you know, the bucket is full when we need it. But if the ice is made in the middle of the night, we don't want a peak power event happening when some other major power is being used in your house. So that's nice that my smart appliances are talking to each other, but who else are they talking to? And we need to make sure that we are the ones empowered by the private data and the activities, because there will be useful tools. There will be better ways to, to turn on and off your home security system. You'll go on vacation and you'll adjust your thermometer. There's a plethora of really interesting and innovative new uh, uses that will be built. Who knew that we wanted to poke each other on Facebook and then that would, you know, be the basis for, for revolutions, for social action, for families being, you know, keeping in touch, for all the different things that are being done with social media, an identity system, you know, of sorts being built for, for the web because we all found it useful to interact with each other. And so we don't even know what the smart uses that the people who build these smart homes will put. But we do know that if it's a data layer, we need to have the rules in place now. So that's really hard. How do you put rules in place now without preventing the exciting things that will happen? And I will tell you, I would have screwed it up. Let's go back to Facebook again. Do you remember when you early on uh, when you uh, signed up for Facebook, you went and you saw your face and your friends and you looked at the picture. And then you could go to visit your friends and click to their pages. And it was interesting, but Mr. Zuckerberg in his brilliance said, no, 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 that's not enough. When you go to Facebook, he said, I'm going to turn on the news feed and you're going to see not your page, you're going to see all the things everyone else is doing, right? And people hated it. I would have said, if I was the chief privacy officer there, oh no, opt in, ask people, because you're changing this. If I break up with my girlfriend, if I lose my job, if I make some announcement about some news in my life, it's one thing to put it on my page, it's another thing to blast it out to all my friends. Ask people first, I would have said. And the users didn't like it either. Facebook used to have 10 million users at that point. A group formed with a million one out of 10 joined the group saying, stop it, stop it, Facebook. You've turned us all into stalkers. We hate it. And people hated it. And then they loved it because it was interesting to go and see what was going on. And you kept coming back over and over and over to see what was new and what was going on. And clearly spreading news, spreading information, organizing so many of the powerful tools of social media are empowered by this notion of being able to share that information widely. I had been against it easily you could have seen strict privacy laws that could mandate very express consent. And many of us would have said no. And so the challenge for people working on privacy law is when is it okay to do something without asking? When is it okay to have the analytics without saying, may I please have the analytics? When is it okay to put people into the water to change so people can see and feel it? I didn't need an iPad and then I did. When is it acceptable how do we know not to harm you? How do we know not to embarrass you? But when can we do something innovative that we didn't think of before without saying, please sit down and give me express permission because either it may not seem useful to you until you do it. That's, I think, one of the real challenges of balancing um, uh, privacy and, uh, and innovation. That's one of the challenges of figuring out how to deal with big data. I was just in Mexico City where um, the annual meeting of all the data regulators where countries have privacy laws, many of them have privacy commissioners, and there's an annual meeting every year, and those data regulators get together and they discuss what are the biggest challenges they faced. And so there was a wonderful presentation about big data. And the presenter showed all the brilliant new things that researchers and companies uh, and others are doing with data sets. You know, Google flu trends can tell hospitals when the flu is going to break out because people are searching for symptoms. Do I have the flu? I'm sneezing. What should I do? And so forth. 
hospitals can learn of outbreaks. Traffic can be analyzed based on the movement of cell phones, and so we can understand better how people converge. You can imagine if one was planning for the Olympics, perhaps a relevant topic uh, you know, to think about in the country, of understanding how people are going to path and the traffic changes and so forth that may need to be made when people come and go from stadiums, and what one can learn by analyzing at a very high level medical research, right? We need to know the outcomes of patients with appropriate privacy protections, but we need those data sets to help learn useful things. So all kinds of wonderful um, data is going to be used for so many interesting innovations. And the response from some of the regulators when they saw this was, not big data means really interesting challenges. We need this data used for innovation, for research, for, for, for the future but it could also be misused. How do we ensure the proper use? How do we provide some privacy by design, some sort of de-identification? What can we do to make sure we get the benefit without the harms? The discussion was very much big data, we need big enforcement. And that's a trivial way, I think, to look at what are some of the really challenging days. We need to think about data optimization. You know, in emerging economies, in areas where the technology uh, advances are going to be a key part of success, we certainly need to make sure that users feel comfortable, feel trusted, uh, have rules and policies and laws in place against abuse and against harm. But we need to leave room open for those innovative, optimized uses of, uh, of data. One of the big issues um, uh, during uh, my uh, days at AOL uh, was a very terrible thing that happened. Uh, one of our very smart researchers put search data, put users' searches on the web. Researchers wanted it. Who knows what they could learn from it? He thought it was de-identified. It didn't have anyone's names. But if I have six months of your searches, boy, I can probably figure out it's you, right? There's just so many clues. And some number of people were figured out, and it became a terrible embarrassment to the company with litigation and stories and lawsuits. And the European data regulator said, oh my goodness, search engines are keeping data for a long time. That's a big problem. Why are you keeping it? Stop keeping it. Well, they can't stop keeping it, right? By using the history of searches, we can improve and make sure that the relevant search comes up. You need to understand how users are searching. Um, you can imagine the sort of analysis and the conclusions and, and the valuable data that can come out of analyzing this. And they said, well, okay, six months. And my question has been, where'd that magic number come from? Who did that analysis of, here's the additional value you get every day from keeping this, and then here's the additional risk. And we need to figure out that model where the optimization and the risk sort of converge so that we can make really smart decisions um, that ensure that we get the benefits of data use, but that we minimize the harms. So I talked about today as a particular turning point. And I will tell you, privacy has always been an interesting issue I've made a living working in it for many years, but what has happened in the past two or three years is that this issue, which was an issue of policymakers, of the geeks, of the technologists, of the experts, this was not an issue that was on the front page. Um, I've worked on a couple of presidential campaigns in the United States, and I end up working on the privacy piece, and then the first of the big debates comes, and the candidates are going to be debating um, important issues about foreign policy and the economy and, and uh, critical issues to the future of the country. And uh, I say to them, okay, I, I've done the privacy briefing book. Shall I meet with the candidate to make sure he's well briefed on the privacy issues? And some much savvier politician uh, than I says, kid, there's not going to be a privacy question in a presidential debate. Are you crazy? This is going to be about you know war and about the oh, peace in the Mideast and about the economy. No one's going to be asking a privacy question to a presidential candidate. But in the past couple of years, that dynamic has changed. The Facebook of the world, the social media of the world, have changed privacy from being something that is sort of experts and chief privacy officers. I remember the first time I told somebody that my job when I was at DoubleClick and when I was at AOL as chief privacy officer, you know, they said to me, um, does that mean like you help fight against spam? Or are you in charge of the parental controls? And when I said no, I try to come up with appropriate policies for ethical data use, 
Okay, thank you. That was not all that interesting. Today you say to somebody, I work in privacy, they say, ah, Facebook, I got it. And so it has become a front page issue where every politician knows that talking about it is of interest. It's of interest to the media and it's of interest to the average citizen. People are concerned about their children. Are they spending too much time? Are they at risk? They wanna, they, they wanna, they, they've always felt challenged at being in control of what their kids are doing online, but all of a sudden their kid has 700 friends. And who are these friends and, I, and how do I understand and how do I have some control over that? But the other interesting thing that has changed is that privacy used to be about big companies or government making decisions about you. And now it's some app developer who lives in the Ukraine who wrote an interesting app that everyone liked and downloaded and now he has 30 million customers but he's 17 years old. The top selling app for a few weeks in the, uh, the iTunes store was a, a bubble popping program where you could just sit and you know bubble pop, bubble pop and it was written by a 14 year old kid who wrote his privacy policy, his mother, right? And, and so what are we expecting of many of these app developers? But some of them have more data than the biggest companies in the country because they can have access to your phone book, they can have access to your location, they can have access to all sorts of useful information that helps provide the service, but it's a lot of information. And we're asking them to what? Have a law firm help them comply with data privacy laws? So we have to make this easy enough and simple enough that that small app developer. But by the way, you, because of your profile and the friends that you are linked to, are now also making decisions about sharing your friends' data and sharing information about them. And you know what? We're not used to it. We talk about the youngsters having to be trained about how to live online. We're not used to it. The other day, uh, in my neighborhood, a friend, well, I didn't know him so well, he's a neighbor, he had a birthday party. Now, I wasn't invited to this party. In the past, I wouldn't know, it wouldn't have bothered me. If I had heard he was having a party and he didn't invite me, I'd have said, oh, well, you know, I'm not such good friends with him, no big deal. But friends of mine were at that party and they were posting pictures. These are grown-ups, 46 years old. They were posting pictures of it on Facebook. Hey, we're at so-and-so's 50th birthday party. And all of a sudden I looked at it and I was back in high school. And I thought those days were beyond us. Now these adults are very smart people. They probably say to their children, don't talk to strangers, okay talk to strangers if they look like they're okay because it's somebody who's you're meeting in a school environment you know we teach our kids how to navigate who they can interact with and we feel like we're going to give them the morals and values but here they all are without thinking twice oh wait a second this is sort of public but it's not completely public because Jules might see it and who's invited and who's not just that day I had said to my son he's um He's 10 now, this was, uh, he was seven or eight at the time, and he was going around his class saying, hey, are you going to so-and-so's birthday party? And I said to him, listen, be careful, not everybody is invited, so you know, you need to be careful, you'll, you'll insult somebody by asking them. But here are the grown-ups without having that same sort of thought that we were teaching our kids. And so we are all struggling, I think, to become good drivers, and we need to make it as easy as driving. The other day, my mother-in-law um, was babysitting um, my uh, daughter, and she let her play a video game on the computer. And my daughter gets on, it's a game she's never played before, and she starts doing and typing and so forth. And my mother-in-law says, she's a genius. How does she know how to do that? And I said, you don't understand. She's grown up with the computer. She knows. You, you look, you pull. If it's red, you click and so forth. I said, you, the other day, you rented a car. You never drove that car before. Did you read the owner's manual? Did you read exactly? And this is a car. It's a machine of death. You can kill somebody with this thing. And you just got in. You looked around maybe where the lights were, changed the gear, and boom, you're driving on the street. And so, yes, the youth of today are, driving, uh, are growing up with some of the skills, but are they growing up with the understanding? And are we, if we're not experts, if we're not using these tools and understanding how to be power users, how are we possibly conceivably helping educate uh, and train our users. Okay, so let me talk for one more second about social media because the big complaint is Facebook, MySpace, uh, other social networks, give us our privacy. And I think I've already suggested that we're sharing this information. It's out there because we want to connect with each other. But what they do need to do for us, I think, is not give us our privacy. We're there to share. What they need to do is give us the tools so that we can shape our identity 
and put our best foot forward and represent ourselves in the way we intend to. It's about our reputation. And what we need is the tools to make sure that the attributes of ourselves, the authentic things that we want to share, are shareable, and that we're sharing the more private things only with family, only with, uh, only with friends, and not with a broader audience. We need to think a bit more about the fact that in today's digital world, people rarely have one job for 40 or 50 years. You know, the way at one point you came and you worked for a company and then you got a pension. In so many countries around the world, people have three, four, five different jobs, which means you're interviewing, you're being looked at, you're being assessed each time. Your digital reputation is critical. Two years ago, we released a study along with uh, Microsoft where they went out and they actually surveyed um, interviewers, people who interview for jobs, and they said, how do you get your information? And as you imagine, 80 to 90% of them said, oh, we search, we look online, we look at social media profiles. This is the new you know, job uh, screening tool. And so you need to take some control, and that doesn't mean hide everything. It means having the tools to delete what you don't want, to put your best foot forward and present. And so you say to yourself, I'm not looking for a job now, so this doesn't matter to me. Well, let me tell you a secret from the job recruiting world. The best candidates are not the people looking for jobs. Some of them are very good, some of them are not so good, which is why they're looking for jobs. The senior headhunters and the recruiters aren't out there looking for people who are looking for jobs. They're looking for the stars, they're looking for the people who are very happy and very good at what they do. And so the really interesting, more senior jobs, that's who they want. They want to steal the really successful candidates and they're not looking, but they're findable, they're out there. So the most important time to have that really good reputation is not only when you're looking for a job, it's when you're not looking for a job and when you're going to be found and discovered and when people are going to um, um, uh, judge and assess. So before I take questions, let me just talk for a second about what's going on globally. Uh, you know, in the U.S., we don't have a global uh, general privacy law. We have a sectoral approach. We protect health privacy. We protect kids' privacy. We protect financial privacy. Um, every time there's a problem, we come up with a law to solve that problem. One of the fastest laws ever passed in the United States was the Video Rental Protection Act because um, somebody was being nominated for the Supreme Court and the reporters we're doing research to try to find out more about this person. And one reporter said, oh, I'll go get his video records from the local video rental store because he's a very conservative individual. Let's go find out what kind of movies he's watching. Congress then said, wait a second, you can get people's video rental records because we rent movies too. And we, whoa, boom, we very, very quickly had a very strict law that protects your video rental records. Lightning fast. But we don't have a general law. And the Obama administration, for the first time, has proposed a very general privacy law with industry groups coming up with codes of conduct that they will pledge to that then can become enforceable under the law. Congress is very bitterly divided. We don't expect to see it happening very soon. One of the reasons why the administration wants to advance a privacy law is because they want to try to become a little bit more interoperable with the European Union. Companies are complaining, are, are chafing at some of the challenges of moving data from Europe to the US. Cloud computing, which has become such a big priority for so many companies, um, where the goal is that the data is anywhere in the world, can clash with European law where you may have to keep the data in a very specific country. So we see countries around the world considering privacy laws, many of them looking to the European Union because they want to be adequate under the European Union, but many emerging economies wondering whether they could ever live with a very strict opt-in privacy law if they want to continue to support innovation and the free flow of data, they want to be data centers, they want to um, ensure that app developers see that country as an attractive and, a, and a, a place where business can be easily done. But at the same point, if there is no protection in place, you've got consumers and you've got countries around the world being concerned that there isn't a, a baseline of safe privacy. And so for a while, you saw a very big clash between the US saying, our way is good, our way is protect particular sectors, our way is have a general consumer protection law, not a privacy law. Tell people what you're doing, be honest, don't deceive them, but not necessarily privacy. And then a very strict European human rights Privacy is a right, it's the most important right, and it overrides very often 
other rights. And so we've seen nonstop arguing back and forth. Now you see the U.S. moving a little bit to try to uh, uh, have a general privacy law. The Europeans, at the same time, looking at their privacy law, looking at their directive, and updating it. It's now been, you know, almost a generation that it's been in place. Um, uh, with the internet changing a lot of the issues. And so we're starting to see the Europeans dis, um, go through a process at deciding what the future of their privacy law should be. So I think the world is at a turning point. I think it's a unique and special time for you to be considering your privacy law. Um, from what I've seen so far, it seems to be a real interesting way of threading the needle. Uh, and you actually may be leading because I think although the US will put out a proposal, we're going to see uh, a challenging political time before you see anything uh, actually pass. And so um, yours may be one of the first interesting new ways to both support privacy, support innovation, and I hope um, support um, an internet where users set the tone for the future uh, as opposed to all the other parties out there deciding what our future should be for us. So I hope that I've talked a little bit about the future of um, internet privacy. I hope I've convinced you there is a future for it, but that the fate of that future is very much in your hands. And I'd be delighted to take some questions.